So for as long as I can remember, I have been fascinated with logos. And nothing gets me more excited than when a graphic designer can take a complex idea and distill it down into a simple, recognizable, and understandable form. And when you can achieve that, these symbols can become vessels for meaning. As a kid growing up, I remember watching films by the National Film Board of Canada that had this really simple logo of a person with their arms outstretched that formed an eye. I mean, think about this, a film production company dedicated to telling Canadian stories. That is genius. Or what about our public broadcaster, the CBC? A C at the core, which visually broadcasts out to Canada and the world. <laughs> and if you like that one, you know, the most distilled logo of them all, one that is considered in the top 10 greatest logos of all time is this one, Canadian National Railways, a single thickness line symbolizing the movement of people, materials, and messages. You cannot get more simpler and distilled than that. Or can you? Look at this, this is a no-name brand. This is a brand that we're all familiar with. And look at this identity. It's one color, one type of face. That is it. And how many people in this room have a no-name product in their house right now? Like, what do you guys think? Like, you know, that's 75-ish, 50%. I bet you there's way more of you guys. You don't even know you have this in, in your house. What about this one? So this was for the Montreal 1976 Olympic Games. And contained within this emblem, you have a running track, which is the heart of the summer games. You have a podium, symbolizing athletic excellence. And of course, the Olympic rings. And this logo, beyond all the other ones, had the biggest influence on my life. Because growing up, there was two things that I loved. I loved sports, and I loved design. And when I saw this logo and the identity that was created around it, I knew I wanted to contribute to become a designer at the Olympic games. And then in 2004, Vancouver won the bid to host the 2010 Olympic Games. And I had felt like, this is it. This is why I'm on the earth. I, I, I have to get a job there. So I dropped out of university. <laughs> twice, twice, actually. I dropped out twice. My parents weren't too stoked about that. And I moved into my grandparents' basement, so I had no overhead. And I took up full-time job of trying to get a job at the Games. And it took me two years, but I got the final spot on the design team. And there were six of us, and we would have been responsible for almost anything you would have seen, from pins to planes to trains to the medals to the torches to the red mittens to the field of play. This is a photo of Granville Street shortly after Sidney Crosby scored in overtime to win the men's ice, medal, ice gold medal. Yep. How many people like, remember where they were in this moment? Let's see, what do we got? Show of hands, okay, I can't even tell. Let's just say 70% here. But you know, this was a transformational moment, at least in my life as a Canadian, because for the first time, it was cool to wave a Canadian flag. You know, I, I never experienced that, and people would high-five you if you did that, you know? That's powerful. And coming out of these games, the Canadian Olympic Committee that's responsible for sending the athletes to every games, they had acknowledged this too, like something happened in this country during these games. And they also had acknowledged that they had this logo that they were using that was like maybe not that great, and there was room for improvement. And they approached uh, another designer on our team, Ben Hulse, and myself, and they asked us if we'd be interested in rebranding the Olympic team. It took us half a second to say, absolutely, let's do this. And in one of our very first meetings, a question came up that would reshape the next eight years of my life. And the question was this, how long has the maple leaf been used to represent Canada? And nobody in the room knew. We had no idea. It had just, I had just lived with this flag my whole life. The maple leaf is synonymous with Canada, Canadian identity. I don't know, since the start, I thought. No, that's not true. When I went home and researched later that day, what I found was that this was our flag until 1965. At the time, our flag was under 50 years old. Can you believe it? Like, this blew my mind. And what started off as just this interesting fact grew into this curiosity. 
And I wanted to understand why this change happened and what that meant. There were some serious social injustices that happened under the watch of this flag. Nikki spoke about some of that this morning. And as this grew, as this grew inside of me, I had, to, I had to meet the people that change it. I had to understand the human stories behind the design of the flag. So I foolishly thought, I'm going to make a film about it. How hard can that be, right? <laughs> Six years later, here I am. But I set out on this quest to meet the designer behind our flag. And this was the gear. I just learned how to use it using YouTube tutorials. The theme of this conference today is Uncharted. You want to talk about Uncharted? I had never made a film before. I didn't even know anyone who had made a film before. I was using this gear for the first time when I was out on the shoots. I mean, I practiced a little bit, but generally, and I made mistakes. I made a ton of mistakes along the way, but my passion for the subject kept me going. Now, it's important to acknowledge that Canada's history with the maple leaf, and particularly the sugar maple tree, goes back to the very first peoples that inhabited this land, to the best of our knowledge, 12,000 years ago. But in 1963, our Prime Minister at the time, Lester Pearson, decided that enough was enough with this red ensign. Canada's 100th year anniversary was approaching. It was time to create a flag. And this started one of the most heated debates in the history of Canada, because you had an older generation that had grown up with the red ensign, that had represented them their whole lives. They felt, why do we need to change it? It's been great for me. But at the same time, you had a younger demographic that had grown up in Canada and were detached from Britain. They had no connection to the colonial past. And that colonial symbol no longer spoke to them. And this was a debate that took place on the radio and television and magazines, newspapers, everywhere. And so what Pearson decided to do was simple enough, we will form a committee to come up with the design. And this was the committee. <laughs> there were 11 members on this committee, and it was a bipartisan committee. And they were given over 3,000 submissions in six weeks. Now, I work in design. There is nothing more terrifying than design by committee, especially, especially, there's not a single designer on that committee. There's no creative director. It's politicians. This is like, this is the worst. Like, this is red tape all over this. <laughs> Nonetheless, this was their tax. So, I'm going to walk you through the three final submissions. First up was what became to be known as Pearson's Pennant. It was the Prime Minister's favorite. It was three maple leaves flanking by these two blue bars that represented the two oceans but there's sort of like a third ocean, so it didn't fully make sense. <laughs> but beyond that, there was no way the conservatives were going to vote for this one because the liberal prime minister wanted it, they were not going to vote it. So although it was an option, it really wasn't an option. Next up was uh, Red Ensign Part 2. So here you can see that they've just simply taken the Union Jack out, threw some maple leaves in there, changed the shield to speak to the colonial past. I mean, this doesn't, this doesn't do anything here. And the third and final option they had was this one. And this is what you do when you don't know what to do. You just put it all in there. <laughs> right? Like, this is one flag, but it's three flags. Like... So the committee chairman had acknowledged that, you know, maybe we, don't, maybe we don't have the solution here. And literally in the final hour, he submitted a fourth concept, and it was this one. It was a single maple leaf. And this was something that all the parties could get behind. And it was unanimously voted in. However, the committee chairman, John Matheson, he had the foresight to know that, you know, this was kind of a rush job. I don't know, maybe we should have a designer, like, take a look at it before it comes our flag, hopefully for centuries. So he contacted Patrick Reed, who was the executive director of a design department within the federal government at that time. And then he hired the best graphic designer that he had available, and that was this person, Jacques Sancier. And unfortunately, all three of these people are no longer with us today. Um, but I did have the opportunity to interview Patrick Reed, and I'm going to let him tell us how we arrived at the flag we have today. 
we had a design which had the two red bars, the formalized maple leaf in the middle, and it was at 13 points. The 13-pointer just looked a little too heavy at the base. Jacques and I discussed this, and finally we agreed to drop two points to bring it down to 11 points, and that was it. Yeah, round of applause. I mean, think about that. Like, it was just a question of like, ah, is it just too heavy down there? And they eliminated two parts. They just chiseled away the excess and look at what they arrived at. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of design. However, flags, I get it. They don't live in isolation. They live in comparison and contrast with other flags. So let's do two quick comparisons. First up, our neighbors in the south. And it's important to understand, you know, I think the differences in our cultures through the design process here. The American flag was born out of war. People died for the creation of that flag. You know, each one of those stripes represent one of the founding colonial states, and every star is kind of represented as almost like these trophies of the states, where ours was formed by committee. <laughs> Pe people work together. Next up, Australia. I mean, they're probably the next closest to us culturally, and their flag is literally called the Blue Ensign. Like, look at that. And, you know, they have six states, so there's six stars on their flag. But what about their territories? They're not represented. And then you look at our flag. There's not three leaves, there's not two leaves, there's one leaf that says, however many people we are, we are one. 84% of Canadians agree that Canada's multicultural makeup is one of the best things about our country. And I believe that it's visually represented in our flag. And to me, it's no coincidence that this flag became almost a rallying point in the Canada that we know today. Shortly after this flag was adopted, it gave us the Official Languages Act, making English and French equal. It changed our immigration policy from a racist system to one that was based on a point system. And it created the Charters of Rights and Freedoms. And I believe the simplicity of this symbol allowed it to become that rallying point for the Canada that we know today. Two years after this flag was adopted was that 100-year anniversary that prompted this whole flag to be made. And for that logo, uh, for that event, they created this logo. And this is maybe my favorite version of all maple leaf flags because it's just so incredibly simple. This was designed by Stuart Ash, and it is triangles. That's it, triangles and a stem. And what I love about it is that it looked as great in 1967 as it does today in a park. You can find this all across the country if you look for it. Now, I don't want to misguide you. Not all Canadian design is great, and not all iconography that we choose to represent ourselves with is exceptional. A few years ago was our 150th anniversary, and the federal government came out with this logo. And to me, this logo is just incredibly complex. There's so much going on here. It's, it's spiky, it's aggressive. Like, if you fell on it, it looked like it would kill you, you know? <laughs> One of those spikes would just go right through your jugular. And like, I'm a practicing designer. I have a visual memory. Like if I look away, I couldn't for the life of me draw that thing. I could never reproduce it. And you look at that logo on the left. I mean, it is so simple. I could explain it to you over the telephone and you could draw it. And I really think that matters. And if this one isn't bad enough, the government in Ottawa decided, well, you know, we can't use that one. We need our own logo, too. So then they created this one, and then they had two logos. And it's like, what are you guys doing? At least pick one. And unfortunately, the hits don't stop here. I grew up in Ontario, in Toronto, and this logo was one that really mattered to me. This was the Government of Ontario logo. It's a depiction of the trillium, the provincial flower. And what I love about it, it speaks to that connection to nature. You can find it in the provincial parks all across the province. And a few years ago, the government decided, you know, we're not, 
We're not about that old stuff anymore. We're new. We're going in new directions. We are energetic. We are with the people. We need to show progress. And they created what has come to be known as three citizens sitting in a trillium-shaped hot tub. I don't know if you should clap at this. I don't know. I don't know if this is clap worthy here. But it's just like terrible, you know? And you can see by them trying to say all these things, they end up saying nothing. <laughs> Douglas Copeland in the film refers to it as three white-tailed deer with their butts glued together. Like, <laughs> who wants to be a part of that? <laughs> However, I understand the world changes. I know that sometimes things need to change. So going back to this moment, 2010, coming out of this. So I'm going to walk through how we approached the redesign of the Canadian Olympic team. So this was the logo that they were using. Um, I mean, it's, it's not terrible, it's not great, but again, there's just so much going on in here. You have a maple leaf that has been stylized, it's a little more curvy. You have the cauldron, then you have a flame that has this like really 90s aesthetic gradient. You have the Olympic rings, and then you have English and French text running all around. Like, look at how long it took me to explain what was happening in there. And so what we wanted to do was using the kind of ethos of 1960s, 70s Canadian design, let's just strip away everything that is not essential. And we put into place for them this. It's a maple leaf, the rings, and an oval. That's it. That's it. And now, I'm not trying to say today that all design has to be distilled down into simplicity. That's, that's not the case. I mean, I think there are opportunities to be louder uh, in other aspects. But when it comes to these identities, it matters. But at the same time, we realize it, everything couldn't just be simple. So we also put into place this graphic um, that is sort of a mosaic that is based off the geometry of the maple leaf. And then comparison and contrast of these two elements, we applied it on things like stationary, three-dimensional space. Now we, here we see it on Canadian athletes, merchandise programs. And here's like a reason for that simplicity. I mean, look at the side of the sunglasses. Like you can still totally identify what that symbol is. That matters. And that matters today almost more than ever. And a few years ago, there was a study done on all Olympic logos. And it came back that Canada was number one the most recognizable logo. And I'm not saying like you change your logo and the complete trajectory of your business or organization changes. Like I get it, that, that doesn't necessarily work that way. But with this logo that was recognizable and understandable, the COC was able to attract better partners that led to more funding, that led to better opportunity for athletes, and ultimately has led to podium success that Canadians have never experienced before. So although this story is about Canada, the, that, the, the, the idea of distilling your communication is relevant to any nation or any business anywhere in the world because good design is good business. Now, I set out on the journey to make this film to meet the designer behind this symbol. And although I never got to meet him, uh, I did have the opportunity to meet his family. And through that, I learned a little bit about Jacques Sincere. Jacques Sincere grew up in a small town outside of Quebec City, and he is a true Canadian. I mean, look at this photo, the single canoeist on the lake surrounded by the forest. That is a photo of Canada. And Jacques Sincere was also a World War II veteran. And when he came back from the war, he decided that he would no longer dedicate his life to destroying this world, but building this world. So he enrolled in graphic design school in Montreal. And although he created one of the most iconic symbols in the history of Canada, he never wanted to take credit for it because he felt that this was a symbol for all of us. And what a symbol he left behind. This is a symbol that speaks to unity speaks to cooperation, speaks to hope. And if you're going to take away anything from my talk today, take away this, that I think it's really important that we all acknowledge that we have a really young flag. Its meaning is still to be determined, and that responsibility lies with all of us in this room. 
Jacques Sincere left us a symbol with incredibly beautiful narrative. Now it's up to us to write the story. Thank you. <laughs>